Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the next session on update on intravitreal injections. Uh, this will be uh, based uh, on one keynote as well as a few other talks. We'd like to bring out a healthy discussion from all the audience to participate, to come up with their frank queries because there will be lots of doubts and questions. Uh, I request the Vice Council, that is a panelist, to come on stage with me. Uh, Dr. Mangat Dogra, Dr. Chaitra Jaydev, Dr. Ashish Sharma, Dr. Rupa Roy, and Dr. Andre Roman. We will first have the keynote talk by none other than Dr. Shobha Seva Prasad, whom you all know. She is a consultant at Moorfields, but more importantly, she is a strong supporter of VRSI and Indian Retina. Uh, one of the very few persons we know actually actively supports uh, Indian Retina, and she would like us all to do more. She is a great inspiration for all of us. She will be talking on early intensive treatment in DMV with uh, Daphne Bursar. Can we have the slides, please? Yeah, over to you, Dr. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Raja. I'm just waiting for them to approve. Uh, it's up there now, so thank you. So good morning, everybody. I'm glad to be here today. So my uh, talk today is on early intensive treatment in diabetic macular edema with aflibacept. So these are my financial disclosures because I do quite a lot of uh, clinical trials. So I will, oh, it's not moving. Yeah, you can use the QR code to scan and send in your questions. I don't know if all the presentations have been checked earlier and uploaded. I don't know if this is uh, related to this particular presentation. Uh, should we go with the second presenter? Okay. 
So I'll first start off with uh, a study that we did led by Sujeda Kukane here on uh, a multi-center study on how diabetic macular edema practice is ongoing in India. So this was a nine-center study. Over 1,853 patients were recruited. This is retrospective, by the way. So it's new onset diabetic macular edema who underwent some form of management with the, each of these hospitals. And you can see that 1,315 people were treated, but only 556 patients or, 1, 000, or just over 1,000 eyes had a follow-up of one year. So that shows that there is a lot of dropout uh, in patients being managed with uh, for diabetic macular edema. But bevacizumab was the most commonly used anti -vegin. What we found in this one year is that in this cohort of patients, there was a mean uh, reduction in central subcovial thickness, but the mean number of injections given was only 2.1 over the whole year, which shows under treatment. I mean, it is an average, so there may be patients who are receiving more injections and there were people who are just receiving one or less. So the average was still way beyond what clinical trials have told us. Most important result in that was the visual equity did not change at all. So there was no gain visual equity in this 12 months. So it shows that we are giving lots of injections, but the visual equity outcome for patients are unsatisfactory in a way. So you can see that uh, every category of visual impairment that we categorize patients in, there was hardly any change. So this highlights that we really need to do something about patients with diabetic macular edema. I can't say that we can follow clinical trials and just give them injections. It will not work in a country where uh, there is out-of-pocket expenditure required to manage these patients. So we need to try and see how we can help manage the patients, get a good visual outcome, and yet not go out of pocket. So I'm going to stress on two things. One is early intensive treatment, and secondly, the drug efficacy. So I'm going back to our days of Ranibizumab. When we had Rice and Ride study, which was the key study for the drug to get its license, there the patients were treated every month. That's an impossible task, but what I want to highlight is when you do that, the maximum visual equity gained in ranibizumab was the first three, four loading doses. So what I'm trying to stress is if we can get that four loading doses across to a patient, the patient is likely to have the maximal visual equity potential at least for a few months. And the same is the RESTORE study. Again, it's a ranibizumab trial where we gave three injections as loading followed by PRN basis. Now here I want to stress the placebo arm was the laser arm. So that laser arm does not show that sort of peak of visual equity rise uh, initially. It takes a long while. What I also want to highlight is that you can see with the three loading doses, that was the maximal visual equity gained by the patient. After one year of laser treatment, they were allowed to switch to uh, ranibizumab, and you can see there again, despite the delay in treatment, the patients, the first four injections are really crucial. This is the protocol I study by DRCR. Again, they had a minimum of four initial monthly injections. So what I'm going to stress is that when you consent a patient, please try and consent them for four or five injections because that's when they get a benefit and in terms of visual equity. Now with protocol I, that's a good one to look for because once you give four injections, what we have seen in clinic as well as our clinical trial is that visual equity is really improves by a line in protocol I, they have this 12 weeks, that is after four injections, what was the outcome? And you can see 50% managed the success criteria, that is 50% managed a visual equity of 6.6 or macula became dry. So I think the take home message from all these ranibizumab trials is that we do need to load our patients. So coming to a flibercept trial, same thing. Have, you can see that the loading phase in square gave the maximum amount of visual equity gains. 
here in this is a asian patients in the vivid and vista trial i want to stress after injection 3 you can see how the visual acuity is deeply improved if we can maintain up to 5 that's when they maintain stability so what whoever you start treatment it will be wise to say you need three injections so you need five injections depending on the uh, amount of uh, funding each have but to give one injection or two injection doesn't reach anywhere they waste their money you waste your time and you do not have a good visual equity outcome so the vivid and vista after their five monthly dosing is a clear example 80 percent of the patients gained one line or more so this is something india we can achieve I mean, in the UK, we are supposed to give five loading doses as well. And we find it very tricky to give the fifth, four and five. But we definitely 90% of the time give three injections. We see the patients in the fourth visit. If they are dry, they can be having that one visit free. Then we give another three. But that is due to logistic issue. But I would quickly stress that it is very important for us to give this uh, loading dose. Now, the question is why aflibercept? So the protocol T is the drug that, uh, that trial that showed us that aflibercept definitely had a superior action here. You can see aflibercept, the blue graph, much above ranibizumab and uh, be bevisuzumab in terms of overall improvement in visual equity or area under curve. And that is why a loading of aflibercept will do a, a lot of good for our patients. I just want to show you an imaginative AUC or area under curve if you do not give our injections the way we planned. So the blue uh, dots, dark blue dots are aflibercept if given according to trial conditions. The second one is any other drug, but after the loading, if you dip and then you inject again, you dip, you get the seesaw effect. The worst is the red line where we give one injection, leave the patient, then try and treat them at some other time and then try and give a steroid, that is the second hum, you end up with the same visual equity the patient started with. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of loading dose. You can do that in real life. In real life, we load our patients, whether it be new patient, recurring patient, or switch patients. So whatever it is, the take-home message is load our patients, please. And once you load, you also have enough data to suggest that the effect will be sustained over one year and perhaps even longer and less number of injections are required the endurance study is a five-year study of vivid and vista and you can see with aflibercept you get the initial load get maximum visual equity maintain them on that and then they require less injections from year three to year five but still maintain visual equity so why is the question why is aflibercept better than the other anti-VEGF agents? And it's probably due to the presence of uh, anti-PGF activity. So diabetic retinopathy, retinal vein occlusion, etc., have a lot of PI PIGF, almost equal to VEGF. So if you only uh, block VEGF, it will not be enough. And that is probably why we are getting a superior effect with aflibercept. This is yet another one how it helps diabetic retinopathy status itself. It improves diabetic retinopathy stabilization of or improvement of uh, DR scale as well, much more than the other two drugs. Of course, we have other drugs like BioView, uh, Brolizumab, but what you have to understand with this, of course, we have the safety profile, which is, we are very cautious. We have never used this for uh, diabetic macular edema or AMD and very few AMD resistant cases in UK. We just don't use this drug at all. Uh, but what it showed is that it's only a non-inferiority in visual equity, but you're taking the stress of giving the injections. And this is the new farizumab trial. Again, Yosemite and Rhine on farizumab, they also need loading dose. There's no doubt that all anti vegf injections need loading dose. The, even, uh, uh, even the farizumab had only non-inferiority in terms of visual equity compared to aflibercept. So in conclusion, our current treatment of 1 plus PRN for diabetic macular edema in, U in, in India should be avoided at all costs. And you have to try and implement early intensive treatment, produce the maximal visual equity, and then hopefully that can be sustained with lesser number of injections. 
If you are starting a patient who had recurrent diabetic macroedema, I would recommend that also to be switched to a loading dose. And all anti-VEGF agents, irrespective of dura durability, etc., need loading doses. Uh, so I advocate at least a loading dose of three, maximum five, and that should do you good. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Soba. Uh, wonderful presentation. So let's have an audience question. How many people in the audience follow one plus PRN for diabetic macular edema? That is, you tell the patient that we'll give one and then we will see if you are okay, we will not give. No. How many give loading dose? Okay, a few arms, quite a few arms going up. Yeah, so again, I'll come back to that. Uh, so it, it, it all depends on how we communicate with the patient. So if we say, we all she can see the data that you need to load the patient. But when the patient starts raising queries and raise their eyebrows, five infections, how often do I, then we keep lowering our bar also probably. Unlike, let's say if it's a cancer, you, know, you, you, you give that uh, you know, protocol of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and you don't, you don't talk that I will decide again, I will decide again. So that is something we need to put across to our patients in a very convincing manner and that uh, you know can lead to a better result. But Dr. Shoba, I wanted to get in protocol AC of DRCR recently, bevacizumab first, then if required switching versus aflibercept from the beginning. Yeah. What is your take on that because there in the US they do have to give a bevacizumab probably as a step therapy. Uh, what is your take on starting aflibercept monotherapy? Well, they sure it's okay, but if you look at the the data, seventy percent of the patients had to be switched to aflibercept. So, what is the point? I think we, with protocol T, we know that the maximum effect is when you start. So, I would definitely want to start on the best treatment, especially when they don't have enough funds for one year of treatment to give at least the first three of three to five aflibercept injections with some, I think there is some, some deal of how to give aflibercept, but still maintain the funding at uh, yeah. 50,000. I, I, I don't know. I mean, there is some form of ability to buy one, get one free sort of thing. So I think cost wise, you will still manage it with maximum visual equity. To I think that's a very good point, which has come up that we should start off with the best treatment. In fact, that protocol AC shows that 70% had to be switched to aflibercept within two years at some point of time. So load and start off with the best treatment. Yes, Ali. Uh, Dr. Lalit, you can use the mic. So let me just talk about Ocitex. I have done four trials on Ocitex, okay, as primary treatment, as switch treatment. None of them had a final visual equity of at least one letter change. So this seesaw effect, you know, the immediate effect of honeymoon period to a patient is good, but you have to give it like every four months and pressure, cataract, and in the end, for some reason, whether we start the patient too late or whatever Ocitex doesn't seem to provide the effect an anti vegf agent does so, so here i would like to bring in Archie. So do you start as primary treatment with Ocitex in any kind of patient or you get the benefit of anti vegf and then sustain with so wanted to say something i think what shoba said let's follow that uh, at least i have experience after this scheme I can tell you, there are several patients now. We tell them we we'll give five injections. They are ready. Why they are ready? After third injection, two are free. They rather ask you, my injection is free, please give it. If you give five, what we have done now in many cases, their requirement of injection come down. They are flat. Their utility is so good, which was never in any of my cases over a period of time. So what Shoba said, I absolutely kind of uh, endorse it as well as we can easily convince with this kind of a scheme which is smart that after third injection you are too free 
they'll agree for five. And you will subsequently find their number of injections come down. They remain mostly flat and they are the happiest patients. So this is what I want to bring. So to uh, answer Raja's question, means my always take is with anti veg up first. So that's my primary thing. I have one question from you, Dr. Soba, because this notion of loading sometimes it goes in a different way to the general audience, general ophthalmologist. So what happens is, for example, I give you a hypothetical situation. You give one anti-VEGF eflibercept injection in a DME case. He comes to six by six and there is no macular edema. So do you still recommend that I complete four and five still? So we definitely complete three because you saw that CST dryness does not correlate with visual equity. The correlation is very poor. To get the visual equity, you have to give the aflibercept for three injections. Mish, my hypothetical situation was patient achieves 6-6 six, six and dries up completely. Then do you still inject on a normal retina and a normal vision, it still completes three? Three, yes. The reason is even protocol I, they loaded four. Then they called it a success criteria. You need that load to get that neurons as well to work. It's not only <clears throat> fluid. So it, it's both. Oh, yes. Can I ask this question to Dr. Shobha? So one very intelligent patient came to me. He said that the pathology of aflibercept is two months. He also, yeah, it's two months. It acts for 60 days. I showed him that there is macular edema. I said when it dries up and he dried up, his vision improved to 6-6. Six, six. I took him back to the OCT and said you're dried up, but according to the literature, you need a second loading dose. He said, why? He said, I am dried. I'm 6'6", six, six. the pathology is, is, is two months, why do you want to load me at one month? So what answers do I have? So for pathology, if you look, what is the half-life within the eye, it is actually much shorter. Yeah. So what we have to then explain to the patient is, for maximal benefit, I mean, there's no doubt a patient is vision 6'6", six, six. CST is 250, uh, Dr. Raja and Dr. Sharma asked the right question. You know, why do you inject the patient? You can, in that circumstance, give it. But how many patients are dry to that level after one injection for diabetic macular edema? It's very, very... No, difficult. even if it is two, ma'am, just uh, I'm just trying no, to I'm, convince myself yeah. and to convince a patient, I need to give a logical... I said the literature says that. No, the literature. Uh, you can use half-life to answer that question. And it, once you load, it is... As I said earlier, it is you get the anatomical architecture back into position. You do need that much. It's just not that intraretinal cyst disappeared, so patient is fine. You will see the difference. We have done a trial on one plus PRN. It did not work. So yeah. uh, I'm pretty, pretty right. uh, sure that no, no, it's just... whether we have to give five is a question. Hmm. Yeah, because if you look at the after three injections, most of them will show that dryness. But we tend to give five because of the SPC. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think we are running out of time. Uh, but thank you so much, Dr. Soba. It's so amazing that these kinds of topics raise the same passionate discussion every time. This is not the first time. Maybe I don't know how many years we have been discussing. But now I invite uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, President of AIS, uh, to talk on biosimilar Osiva as initial experience. Thank you. Uh, I'll continue from where Ashish left in Hall A uh, and are back. Uh, that we are proud Indians that we have uh, so much biosimilars, uh, you know, to start with. And I thank the entire BRSA for being here. We all understand that anti have really revolutionized the management of this condition. It all started the Avastin, Nitrogen, Lucentis. You see, the problem with all this is very extensive. Now the cost has come down. A lot of schemes uh, like the number two, three, or two plus three, all these schemes are available, but still expensive considering the chronic nature, considering treatment burden, number of injections per year. And it's not a one-time treatment, believe me, and different injections are required. And all these studies which uh, Dr. Shobha was referring to, they all say that we require multiple injections to sustain the gain. You see, with the MTVHS, there's no doubt they work, there's no doubt, but it's a fine, not a finite treatment. It's keep injecting, keep injecting, like something like Lagara Omanave, keep injecting. And the, but the real birth scenario, Shoba said 2.1, but the luminous study said around 5 injections by 50% of the patients. And believe me, the, the reason behind it is economics. Patients can't afford it. Patients, even I may not be able to afford so many injections in a year. And patients get mentally exhausted. 
2015 saw this you know biosimilars uh, from india and uh, it was uh, you know at that time it was propagated that biosimilars have uh, you know potential to reduce the cost by around 40 to 50 percent and it's not only cost for injection it's the, it's the number of injections the travel visit the relative coming along with consultation imaging all these things add to the you know economics of this injection and if you compare the innovator versus the biosimilars which are now two three in india you see the cost is much much less reduction is there definitely uh, and there is a bias in the boom now we in india have now multiple biosimilars in fact in us also uh, you know by two biosimilars of have been approved and the year 22 is set to be a turning point and you see there is a lot of saving one point uh, you know 133 billion dollars in aggregate saving by 2024 you see for biosimilars uh, what uh, ashish was saying in the morning myths about safety efficacy trials all these things i am telling you they, they, they don't exist now because a lot of studies are there to test safety efficacy and so much public literature is there just to show you a couple of my slides uh, of this biosimilar you see the miraculous effect uh, with this biosimilar and another patient of amd showing with one injection miraculous effect meaning thereby efficacy definitely there Safety also is there. I just show you a couple of examples of UCBA, which uh, I had the opportunity to use. Uh, you know, 12 patients, 67 year old male, one injection. The reason I take photograph every time is to convince you that there is no haze, there is no uh, you know uh, compromise. There's another patient, 55 year old PDR with CME, and you see the effect which this patient has uh, with uh, one injection. Because I have follow up only 40 days. 38 year old, you know, left eye. There is evidence of ERM plus DME. We gave one shot and did the surgery also ultimately. So there was a compounding benefit of surgery also in this patient. 62 year old uh, uh, ARMD patient given OCBA, and you see there is a consolidation of SRAM and the definite reduction in the MCC. Another patient, uh, diabetic uh, right eye, you see miraculous uh, effect by one injection of OCBA. In fact, that can then it record. And uh, this second injection of OCBA we gave to this patient. Again, this was done only one day back. You see, 29th, I saw this patient. The, the, the scene was this CST. And 30th, you see, there's a dramatic reduction with one injection of post or injection. So, this was the compilation I did uh, pre post patients who have follow up of more than one month because we had just started uh, using OCBA. And you see, separate thickness also, you know, going for uh, mean visual equity, also showing benefit as well as symptom thickness. So, biosimilars are the savior for this country they are the delight for the patient as the doctor because compliance improves with the cost reduction is there and is it only the cost not the cost plus comparable efficacy and safety uh, is there. and if this becomes very important if there are more than one crore of patients who require treatment in india and uh, believe me this matters once the patient has to pay from his pocket if somebody else is paying nothing matters he has to pay from his pocket the revenue does come and believe me, in the end, I just like to conclude by saying today, as I stand, whether it is uh, Nusiva, whether it is Brahmi, or whether it is Rasumab, it's a race between money pot ultimately. And ultimately, it's the price what which is going to dictate our choice uh, of usage of biosimilars in this. Thank you very much. Yeah. For Thank you so much, Dr. Lavit. Very sweet and short. And ultimately, the big point which you have made is that the economics. Uh, going to be the ultimately the price at which they are giving it to the patient. At some point, indirect costs also come in. It's like every month visit versus something which can be done every three or four months. Some of the newer molecules. Uh, but uh, Dr. Lalit, do you have any idea how many Osiva injections have been given overall so far? In uh, I have no idea, but I have given uh, thirteen now. Ashish, I think. I think that there may be people. Who around you see the fear fear about its safety that is what you see i take picture first day then seven day then one month just to see there is no i there's no problem. yeah so for all biosimilars i think more and more are in the pipeline so you hear so many companies coming including apple Burstep. the first and most important question will be uh, safety Efficacy probably is going to be similar. So my ultimate request to all these people would be to reduce the MRP. If we have to translate the benefit to the community, the MRP has to come down so that uh, you know we can offer this treatment, wonderful treatment, to at a low cost to our patients. So, uh, Andre, if I can ask one question, what's the situation of biosimilars in South America or maybe Brazil in specific? 
We have the mic on, please. Podium mic. Press it. Hello, hello. Yeah. yeah. So we're we're just starting. We actually did a few studies on the biosimilar of Flibercep. It worked very well. We have to decrease the osmolarity of the drug because it's different. And um, but it, we're it's still starting. We don't have it approved yet in Brazil. But I think it's it's probably a, a way to go to a country such as India and Brazil as well. So it may have a very important role, especially in in areas that are undercover and people that don't, don't have uh, insurance. So one question, sir. Uh, yes. In what price bracket have you kept Osiva? Like you already have Razumab. So how do you, we you know? <laughs> Because that is an issue. See, that I ultimately said, you know, let me be frank here from this podium, it is ultimately a ophthalmologist need which is uh, not leading to compliance. Believe me, if uh, you price it, uh, they can price it because the procurement price is much, much lower what is being charged to the patient. Procurement price for the biosimilars is around 8,000 bucks only. And if you can add to the cost of OTA injection, patients should get it around 14, 15,000 bucks. Not at seven percent. Yeah, so that is something we can. That is my dream. In. That is my dream actually, because if the company can provide you for that cost, therefore I keep arguing with these people. Why don't you reduce the MRP? Otherwise, you see, people can the, the all the entrepreneurs will charge MRP plus C cost. I want procurement price plus C cost. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lalit. I now invite uh, Dr. Andre Romano from the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, very well known, uh, not just in Brazil, but also around the world uh, for his work in Retina. Uh, he will be talking on managing DME and RBO in real. Over to you. Thank you very much, Raja. And thank you very much for the organizing committee for having me here. It's a pleasure. It's my second time in India. Last time I was in Palampur in the REACH meeting. Well, uh, so speaking on managing DMO and RBO in real life, uh, this is my disclaimer. So the first thing we have to bear in mind in treating patients in real life of the, with uh, DME and RDO is our bar biomarkers. There are two definitions of biomarkers, one from the NIH and the other one from the World Health Organization. The NIH uh, puts a biomarker, um, a characteristic that objectively measured um, and evaluated an indicator of normal biologic and pathological process or pharmacological response uh, to a therapeutic intervention. However, the um, uh, World Health Organization says the biomarker is any substance, structure, or process that can be measured in the body or its products and influence or predict the influence of outcome of disease. So this is important. So both the definition can be divided in two types. One is associated with prognosis, uh, and which identifies uh, a decreased risk of future disease prevention or remission. And the other one is, uh, is a predictive that identifies patients who are likely to have therapeutic benefits. So there are a number of possible assessments that are taken during the eye exam that can be viewed as a biomarker. But in this lecture, we'll, we'll focus on OCT and, and, and structural information. So in order for us to better understand imaging biomarkers, there are some fundamental information of mechanism diabetic retinopathy and RBO. And uh, so, so there's some um, information such as anatomic information, for example, Exo length reduces the risk of the uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy. Soluble markers are indicative of the state of activation in the eye, decrease of ischemia versus inflammation, and structure markers may reflect function as well. Furthermore, we are, we're known that hyperglycemia lead to infl inflammatory biomarkers that leads to proliferative diabetic maculopathy, edema, and also uh, RVO. Um, it, we also know that an imbalance between fluid uh, entry and fluid exit leads to diabetic macular edema. This is very important. So let's talk about some structural information. Um, structural retinal alteration is a predictor of response in, 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 in um, DME and, and IVRIO. So there are, in the literature, they're full of information about markers that predict the treatment response with anti-VGF or a steroid implants. Uh, I'm not gonna go into each and every one of them. They're, they're all published in there. But I'm going to focus on a few of them that make uh, that they're very uh, important. So two, three of them are drill, which is the disorganization of the retinal inner layers, 
The, uh, the other ones are um, um, the EZ, the damage of the lipsoid zone, the photoreceptors. And also we can see some hyperreflective dots or, or hyperreflective foci in these patients. As we all know, real is the disorganization of the inner layers, as you can see it in here, and in the anterior retina. And EZ is, is the issue that we have in the photoreceptor area. So if you have a disruption there or a damage, that's the patient. So these, these images explain how we measure drill. In essence, the scan take through the fovea, and, and we focus in the middle line, and we looked at it in there, and then this is important for, for um, scanning patients with uh, diabetic retinopathy and also DME, and also uh, RVO. So many authors have also identified that some of the hyperreflective foci uh, have, it could be associated with the activated microglia, migrating at the subretinal space. In the present, this, this thought can be a prognosis of worsening of, of uh, and visual, also visual uh, bad prognosis. Uh, and so here, uh, here the, the, the foci, uh, you can see it in there. I'm gonna just cite a, 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 an example of a patient that came to me that underwent 15 injections, and I think that has to be uh, related to the, uh, the first talk. Patient had um, only one first dose, and then um, waited for five months, none, no dose, and then 14 dose in, in about three years. So she came to me uh, with this, uh, you can see there, there is a, there is a very bad a drill there, uh, the photoreceptor are really damaged. I explained, I decided, we decided to do a dexamethasone implant. However, we explained to the, to the lady that it wouldn't work because maybe we have structural information uh, working fine, but functionally it wouldn't work. So we did the injection. As you can see, uh, structurally it's much better than before, but functionally uh, it, was, it was terrible. One thing that is very important to, uh, to outline is that some of the information that we have now with OPTA. So the most recent technology we have today is, the, of course, OPTA is a new leap in ophthalmology. And we decided to retrospectively review uh, our patients to determine accuracy in disease progression in patients with DME and diabetic retinopathy. So in order uh, to do that, we quantify operations. We decided to use some of the algorithms, such as a uh, flow area, uh, FAZ area, perfusion density mapping, and so on. So, uh, so again, as we see in, in many of the studies, we know that the deep capillary path flexus was the most accurate to determine high risk diabetic retinopathy patients compared to the uh, superficial capillary layer, independently if it's a three by three, six by six, or eight millimeter scan. We also learned that the fovea vascular zone error increases while vessel density and flow area decrease both in the superficial and also in the deep capillary plexus. We, we, also, we also learned uh, that uh, the deep capillary plexus had, uh, had a, a significant difference in, in mean measurement in three by three and six by six millimeter um, uh, scans. So by trying to determine the accuracy in these patients in diabetes and, and to, to seek progression and see how these patients do either injection or anything else, We've learned that the, the vessel density, the, the deep capillary plexus, is the most accurate parameter with high specificity. And the fovea vasculars on the deep capillary plexus show the greater sensitivity in detecting high diabetic endopathy patients' risk. Greater accuracy diagnosis in high risk diabetic endopathy patients were found in the deep capillary plexus uh, in uh, parameters, in the 3 by 3 scan uh, parameters, and were more significant and more accurate compared to the 6 by 6 millimeter scans. So we also learned that it, as, as diabetic retinopathy progresses, fovea vascular zone increases in flow area, and flow area and vessel density decreases with a greater significance in the three by three millimeter scan and the deep capillary flex. So the take a whole message is inflammatory appears to be correlated, correlated with DME. Local cytokines profiles indicate inflammatory cytokines have great importance in the, uh, than the uh, VGF uh, levels alone. Structure changes in the retina and inflammatory marks are correlated. Uh, Hyperflective hyper foci are proposed as imaging OCT biomarkers of retinal inflammatory eyes in, in eyes with DME. And their presence in the outer retina and or subretinal fluid in DME and RVO, BRVO, is correlated with decreased central activity. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Andrew. Very nice uh, presentation. I would like to bring in Dr. Rupak's uh, 
thoughts on the biomarkers that Dr. Andre has mentioned. Uh, which ones do you consider for patient management as such in terms of the uh, type of injection that you would like to give in DNA? Let's say high reflective dots. Uh, would it make any difference to the choice of injections and how do you decide? So, uh, let's sort of talk about these biomarkers, especially these hyper reflective dots. In the retina now they have been found in uh, dots the choroid also and it has been postulated that uh, they represent macrophages and an inflammatory component and might respond to a steroid implant better but to be honest in uh, in our day-to-day -day practice i have not really found any difference uh, the patient in the real life case scenario uh, whether if I see a lot of hyperreflective thoughts, the presence of that biomarker uh, to determine my injection. So, in the present day, what I would consider the biomarkers that mostly affect my treatment outcomes are the retinal treatments. So it, and the pro to prognosticate, obviously, the ellipsoids. So, hyperreflective thoughts appear very promising, but I don't know how many of us really using that as a marker to decide on the type of it. I think that's a very good answer that you have given, Dr. Rupin. In the sense, while many patients do have hyperreflective dot, we still proceed with an anti vegf agent. Uh, the, the edema and thickness are important determinants, and ellipsoid zone can be used as a prognostication. But Andre, uh, if I can get back to you, when we look at high reflective dot, to me, it looks like almost any patient with DME, if you look carefully, probably will have high reflective dots. But do you use them in any particular way, like beyond a certain number uh, or the location, and then you start talking to the patient about uh, switching to a different agent? So we're doing uh, different studies compared. Uh, I don't know, do you guys use a lot of microperimetry here in India? Uh, not much, I would say. So, so what we're doing, we are actually trying to advance in understanding this information compared with the functional testing. So uh, we're using, we have uh, two micro perimeters and we also developing a virtual reality. We develop along with Baston Palmer, we're developing a virtual reality micro perimeter. Uh, uh, so what we're doing, we are actually comparing some of this information, both in OCT, OCTA, and the vascular density in the, uh, on the um, OCTA with the micro perimetry. The thing is that we're noticing that some of these um, bio, biomarker, inflammatory biomarkers may have a, uh, a good indicator of function as well. Uh, we still have, we don't have a lot of patients because uh, we're focused on the VR mostly now because it's easier to use, it's faster. We're using an area about, um, it's like five by two on the, on the visual view, but it's, it has more dots. And, and apparently uh, the, I, I cannot tell you the, the result yet because we don't have the final results. We have to run through the biostatistician and also we don't have much patience. But I do think there is, there is a way of comparing it. But I think the future is more uh, functional testing. Yeah, that, that's a very important point that you have brought out with virtual reality, the ease of testing and going beyond just visual activity, high contrast testing. Yeah, we, we are using artificial intelligence I, maybe I can show in the a later lecture uh, some of the data that we have uh, on the on the on the VR the virtual reality uh, headset with our artificial intelligence and some of these patients. We yeah. have a lot of. Uh, thank you so much, Andre. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much for coming from far away and uh, sharing us uh, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to remind all the audience that you can use the uh, QR code to scan and then type in your questions you can see it here and ask the panelists i now invite uh, dr muna bende uh, senior consultant at shankar netralia to talk on resistant diseases uh, on pcb amd and dme and i know she is a wonderful teacher and we all will learn anytime that she speaks something different and more over to you doctor thank you raja for the kind invitation and uh, we are aside for asking to talk on this topic uh, well, anti vegetative agents for costly vegetative diseases are maybe the almost perfect cure, but occasionally one may find a resistant disease. And I'll just share a few instances where I think I did something different. 
there are various ways in which you can gauge the response to academic treatment, and I refer you to this article in which you compare even the anatomical and the functional response. And various definitions, especially the DRC net definition, which tells you what success, improvement, and no improvement is. And also what is persistent and what is chronic But when you find the patient not responding as you like, you will probably want to look at it along these particular lines to analyze what is actually happening. Most importantly, the protocols used for the patient and the type of response. Now, to rule out mimicus, that is probably the most important in this era of post -day. Look at the BCN and rule out the most important, that is the third one, where due to projection artifacts, you think it's a matrimony of vascular membrane, it's actually just atrophy, and you may be just treating the patient without really knowing what you're doing. And also, an important differential is the loose use, which is an avascular, uh, avascular phenomenon versus an actual. CND, which would respond to treatment. The third important cause in an elder, older patient is a vitreliform lesion, which is actually avascular and doesn't really change with antigen therapy. And once you define the response, this is a general guideline that I found very useful to manage your regular symptoms. What I'm going to share is something that was a little different. This is a gentleman I've been following for four years, almost five years. And at the end of 22 injections and one PDP, he was maintaining a vision of 6676. You see a type 1 lesion with a little bit of subretin. We know SRF can be tolerated. So we just used to follow him up. And then he vanished for two years, thinking that everything was fine. And one fine day came with a vision of 6 by 16. The only positive mm -hmm. history was he had a PTCA and was an antipoietic. You look at his OCT, you see that the retinal structure is fairly well maintained except for the subretinal blood. So I did a pneumatic displacement and treated him with ranibisumab, which is what he had responded to earlier. This is the result, and the last ranibisumab, he maintained the vision of 6 and 6. So this is when you decide when to go on with treatment and when to stop. Now, this is an elderly lady who presented with a recent drop in vision. You see the polypoid lesion running under the pigment epithelial detachment, a little bit of fibrin in the subretinal space. Note the dramatic response to aflibacept at one month. He was so happy, she said, I'll come after two weeks. And this is what happened after two weeks. The second injection, she did better, SRF had gone. I went to the third injection and it was flat again. After the fourth, after having burnt my fingers, I said, let me give you a fourth injection. But if you see the fourth injection, the response is not that great anymore. And then after the fifth injection, this is what happened. Look under the phobia, you see there's a little bit of fibrin now. And then she decided to come back after a month. And you see the same exuberant fibrinous response. And now there's a large rip at the phobia. And this is a month later, you see that the PED is now crumbling. There's more fibrin at the phobia. And you have this huge pigment epithelial detachment. I gave her the seventh injection. There was no response. If you see here, there is no response. Then I switched to bronostin. And this is what happened. Two weeks later, the PED grew. And then it grew even more. And then we just reviewed our criteria. I did an FFA and ICG and found there were not one, but there are two ribs. And you see this large peripapillary polypoid lesion just coming within the peripapillary region up to the phobia. There was no PDT at this time. In the presence of a rib, I would be hesitant to do PDT. So I switched to ranibizumab. You see on the left, the excellent response to ranibizumab, the lesion flattened. And then if you look after the second injection, the lesion grew again. So you have a patient here with tachyphylaxis where the response is going away very fast. So what did I do at this point? I said, let me try something unconventional. I gave Osvix. I gave Osvix and Ranibizumab again. And if you look at the top lesion, this is my OCT machine which behaves funnily. So you look at the images on the top, that's what happened. The lesion flattened with the combination. This is her OCTA showing a good response. And I've continued her on Ranibizumab and now she's awaiting combination therapy. So sometimes you have to deal with tachyphylaxis, you have to 
deal with rips, you have to deal with exudation, when you have to probably think a little bit out of the box and think maybe there are non-VEGF pathways in a predominantly VEGF inspired business. Now, this is a gentleman who responded dramatically as far as OCT is concerned to the anti-VEGF injections for CME. Then we gave a pause in treatment and it recurred. Then after six injections, you see this fibrotic lesion of the phobia. Now, why did we pause the patient? This is because clinically, with every response, he was showing fibrosis. And this happened every time. And this is when I decided, yes, you suspend treatment because it's no longer important. More importantly, this was his only act. So these are the stages at which you decide that enough is enough and you need to know when to stop. And this is again an example of not waiting for six injections. You see, after three injections, you there's not much change in the macular edema. You see this large retinal capillary macroaneurysm close to the phobia. So then we decided, let us treat this patient with yellow laser because the lesion is close to the phobia, persisted with the anti vegf injections. And this is how the patient is now when all the edema has gone away and the macroaneurysm has closed. I have two interesting cases. It's a young patient with direct atrophy, diabetic retinopathy, and cystoid macular edema. It was under our care from the year 2013. Difficult to manage his diet, difficult to control his diabetes, so his medications kept, kept switching. And then he had this macular edema, which was not going away. Finally, we decided to change the medication. He was not on a glit glitazone. So after change of medication, the, the CME vanished and he remained stable. So in 2017, we said, wow, there's a drug other than glitazone which causes CME. And then I was preparing for this talk. And what did I see just a few weeks ago? Metformin can be used for patients as an adjunctive treatment for DME. Maybe that is what actually worked in this patient and it was not the other drug which was causing the edema. So my last case is a patient with a scleral fixated IOL, an exposed proline suture, and diabetic macular edema, query pseudopake CME, who had already received anti vegf injections elsewhere, came to us for a second opinion, pressures were high, he was put on medication, we covered him with antibiotics because we didn't want to cut that proline suture, consider anti vegf vision drop, so a month later pressure had gone up, edema had gone up, he was they added on netters in a row and is inhibitor. We stopped never nepaphenic because we felt it wasn't working and the eyes were looking red. I said, he said, I'll come back in a month for the injection. Two months later, you see all the edema has gone away. And we know that row and is inhibitors may be used in macular edema as well. And he is now not in anything other than his uh, anti glaucoma medications, and the eye has remained quiet like this. So this is a little schematic of how to analyze a patient who's resistant to anti vegf therapy. And uh, this is my uh, message at the end of the case. Most importantly, bookmark your difficult and unusual cases. You never know when you need them. I welcome you all in June for the retinas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Nina. As I said, we learn a lot that there were the last few slides told us how to approach, what to look for. Um, uh, Chaitra, uh, have you uh, considered like the first case Dr. Mona showed, a patient having initially response to ranibizumab, then did not have, and then switched to aflibercept, and then still didn't work. And ultimately, I was thinking, as soon as I saw this aflibercept still not, I thought, okay, when, when would you think of brolicizumab and she showed? But then that also created problems. So what would you think, do you ever consider OZDEX with anti -vegif? So I have done that for a couple of patients with AMD who had a predominantly intraretinal fluid uh, compartment, but never as a first line. And uh, this must be a one-off case because we don't also so rapidly uh, shift and then come back full circle to ranibizumab. So I think it's uh, rather an odd case where we've gone back to the primary drug where, wherein we're hardly ever using ranibizumab for uh, you know AMD now unless the patient's uh, biomarker is the affordability. We hardly ever do that. So, so yes, I this is my second case. I have another one right now where I skipped brolicizumab. And but went straight back to ranibizumab with Ozodex. So I have tried a combination, uh, but not uh, Ozodex uh, per se for uh, AMD. I've used it with IVQ. That 
for the two of his patients have done very well and the patient uh, himself comes back and only asks for a comment because he knows that we have tried and tested every other drug and this somehow seems to be working. Yeah, so I have published uh, last year uh, about a resistant case of PCV, OZDEX plus anti-VEGF presented ASRS. Now I have more than 20 patients. So whenever we have resistance, uh, it's, it's a very nice way of uh, treating them. In fact, I haven't seen any patient not responding to it after that. But thank you so much, Dr. Mona, uh, for the wonderful case. Why combination? Why not only OZDEX? Because your, your uh, anti-VEGFs have failed. So why you want to give double the injection? Why not only try Ozurex? Sir, actually I, I didn't show you all the pictures, but I have an OCT. I didn't do Ozurex plus Ranibizumab the same day. I did Ozurex, imaged a week later before giving Ranibizumab. The PED did come down, but she has active vascular memory. So in this situation, I would be hesitant not. What will happen if I don't give anti-VEGF now because I'm really stuck? Because I have tried at least in such cases only all the day. Once all these things fail, it works as well. Yeah. So that's why I thought I might as well bring down this. Yeah. And then? Yeah, I had, I had the same way. So I, I've done Ozodex, waited like for two, three weeks, then I did anti -VEGF. Another option for these cases are that I have tried, I switched to the drug, but instead of doing every 30 days, I did every 15 days. And it worked even better. Two anti-VGF injections, one followed by each other by 15 days or two, two, two weeks and a half or something. Actually, for me, the issue was the exudation and the ripple, which yeah, is that, kind you know, of very complex. Down. Yeah, so, but in EMD cases, I think anti-VEGF is still the primary treatment compared to DME or are you where you can still give this Prozatex? But at some point, whether you give a combination or, you know, maybe staggered, you still probably would need anti in between sometimes. Yeah, so what I did was I, I waited, I did the Ozerdex, waited two weeks, did another OCT, another functional test, and, and then I did anti VJF just in case. Yeah, that's also good. Good. Yeah. I mean, the, the study is still ongoing. Um, I, the 8 milligram, I don't know if the but you have any experience on that? Oh, okay. Also have to load 8 milligrams, but uh, 16 weeks uh, is very durable. It's actually the results are fantastic. The overarching results, uh, we don't know any internal, any cup analysis. Okay. Good. Okay, thank you so much. We'll now move on to the next presentation by Ashish. He'll be talking on what else uh, other than biosimilars. He is the world-renowned expert on that. Uh, is there a differentiator for clinicians in evidence-based analysis? Over to you, Ashish. Once again, thank you, VRSI, for giving me the opportunity. So, means we have been having these biosimilar talks since morning, and uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, he just spoke about Oceva. So, it means you have multiple molecules. Now, the question comes, you know, do you have some kind of differentiator that would help you to decide apart from the kind of uh, finances that you look upon? Before I proceed further, these are my disclosures. And this is our contribution uh, in understanding various biosimilars across the globe. And I would like to thank all these people across the globe. So we know definition wise uh, that what biosimilars are company need to prove by their trials that they are safe, pure and potent as similar to reference biologics. There could be some differences because they cannot be the copy because biological lines are involved there. So why biosimilar predominantly cost benefit that we all know now. The question is, at present, if you really look at the ranibizumab and aflibercept biosimilar, only ranibizumab biosimilars are approved across the globe. Now, is EMA approved, UK approved, FDA approved, and India already, you know, we have been using them since 2015. Aflibercept biosimilar, Regeneron, Regeneron is pretty smart. They have again extended their patent, so probably we would not see them 
uh, till 2025, 2026. So let us talk about India. You have three major companies who are making biosimilar ranibizumab. I just want to clarify here that there are three major companies, but you talk about five brands here. Ultimately, producer. produced by Lupin, but it is branded by Sun Pharma. Ren Israel, produced by Reliance Life Sciences, it was branded by Cipla under the name of Bizumab. So we need not to be confused that, you know, these are different drugs. And in Japan, he's one of our very good friends. They, are, they have already started using Ren Bizumab BS1 from Senju Pharma, again, national approval alone. Now, if you look at the US, UK, Europe, SB11 is has a similar name across everywhere but FYB201 is known as Ongavia in UK, Cimarelli in FDA, Renibizio by EMA. So now the question is, is there a differentiator for clinicians across the globe? Means do I need to see a trial design? Do I need to see primary outcomes? Do I need to see equivalence margins? Or do I need to see the total duration of a study and how the trial was done? So overall means these are the kind of factors which come into play whenever you know you see a molecule coming in we you know to find out that what exactly clinicians they want so this is our international group which is a uh, which has done a survey in the recent part which was published it was predominantly a us and europe survey indian survey is underway that what exactly clinicians they want as a differentiator so Unfortunately, means I was in the initial talk. If you really see, although FDA and EM is trying their best to say that the, these clinical trials are short and designed with some wisdom, but still, still there is a noticeable perception. Still, people do not believe that has happened in the past with non ophthalmology also. So, what we found through this survey was everybody wanted a real world data because safety was questionable so if you look at fda uk ema drugs which are approved we do not have any real world data yet japanese biosimilars i am working with them but we do not have the real world data out indian biosimilars yes we have so ultimately real world data is the one which is required by clinicians to have faith in these molecules at this point this is the paper for renuzuril from reliance biosciences we have published our experience with 22 eyes in 34 injections Total injections given till now is 15,000. Now, rainy eyes, no real world data yet, but it is under preparation with 200 injections. Total injection number used is 3,500. Now, the extensive real world data comes from resume, obviously, because it was approved in 2015. So, we have plethora of papers, published data. So, if you really check about the numbers, 9,753 eyes. 9,603 patients, 19,118 injections, and a lot of great contributors like Dev Dulal, he's sitting here, and I think a lot of people, you know, Dr. Alai, everybody's there, you know, who were the users, and they have contributed for all these papers. So total injection number is 4.5 lakhs. Here, I would like to disclose this presentation. I have a conflict with the resume here. So for as if you really talk about the differentiator as of now, you have maximum real world data in the experience with intas molecule and it is approved for all the indications that includes rop as well however none of the other brands have rop approval till now reliance life sciences was approved in 2020 and as well, as far as i know till now it is approved only for new escort amd lupin was approved in november 2021 except rop they have approval for all the indications so again, my slide for all the biosimilar talks ends with this. Education, education, and education. If you really want to share this benefit across the globe and increase the access to many patients who are in need. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ashish. That was very short and sweet. Um, Dr. Dogra, I have a question for you in the sense we, we have so many biosimilars now. And I'm assuming there will be more, not just for Ranibizumab, Aflibercept also in the future. 
and at uh, some point of time all clinicians would be flooded with requests from different companies use mine use mine use mine in the sense what would you be looking out for ultimately is it just the price or is there is there something you feel based on all the studies is there actually a difference between different companies bus uh, well i have only experience at present with razumab as far as the biosimilars are concerned and this is also i would say for the last uh, only about 2 years we were very uh, kind of uh, ethical because in between some things were happening uh, but once we started using uh, we look at not only the price but it is everything looking at the safety efficacy and at this time uh, if you ask me probably their numbers have gone up uh, very high just not because of any other reason because they are very safe of course economical factor is there as well as uh, they have shown uh, efficacy i would say as good as uh, probably a parent molecule running uh, with so that is what our experience uh, so so if you see uh, carefully actually that the ranibizumab biosimilars are actually taking up the vasizumab market share actually a vast in the market share at least in india so it's it's not as if ranibizumab uh, biosimilar is affecting more of ranibizumab original it is but you see a lot of people now avoiding avastin rather using ranibizumab biosimilar. andre you have a point yeah i have a question for you sure. if you don't mind so two questions one a local question what what is the ra- range price for these drugs here in india the biosimilar a range price means compared to innovator yeah how much is a uh, 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 you know the uh, i mean um, regular anti vgf such as lucentis ilia and so on in here and the biosimilar so approximately if you talk about the means reference biologic which we call as a means of, uh, on which they are compared so lucentis versus the biosimilars everything almost 40 to 50% now no i mean in terms of price how, how price okay you want to know the price, price. probably means if i convert in dollars which you would understand US probably yeah So probably it means now it's around hundred dollar for a biosimilar to purchase. But if you really complete the procedure, it would be probably one fifty to two hundred US dollars. And how much is the Lucentis here? Lucentis is probably just a double. Double, okay. These are okay. after applying all discounts. Yeah, and the second I've noticed that you publish a lot, and and second is how about the safety? Safety in real life, real life. Yeah, real life safety is amazing. That's what it means. I have been emphasizing that what has happened, which comes always. during these discussions with intas initial batches that was because of the high endotoxin levels defined by the iso which companies were following but now after fda is strengthening the uh, endotoxin limits now you would not see that safety issue at all the only thing is what i am foreseeing that where india has a flip at this point is if you look at uk if you look at europe you look at the entire world the highest you you have heard talk by dr soba also means entire world is predominant user of flibercept we don't use it and the major reason is just the cost so i'm hoping you know once we have in couple of years a flibercept biosimilar that would be a real game changer for this country and probably you know the our primary usage would be that molecule which we are unfortunately unable to use in spite of you know a great efficacy and great molecule I think this was a great talk. We will have lots of uh, questions. Uh, Chaitra, you have a question. Raj, I wanted to ask you since uh, Dr. Munna spoke about tachyphylaxis, uh, and you need to switch. Would you ever switch between an innovator and a biosimilar, or would you go to a new uh, molecule altogether? Go to a different molecule altogether. Yeah, but uh, actually, in in terms of s- switching. we'll have more and more options now coming up including farizumab now we have already used brolizumab we don't know uh, how the others will pan out but between uh, a biosimilar and innovator i would not go for chetra there is a great great answer for that they have been very equivalent in terms of their primary secondary tertiary quaternary protein structures so they are essentially the same molecules so it does not make any sense for switching between biosimilars and the reference molecule switching wise dr muna means uh, she presented that actually i do a lot of back switching and that works even from a high end molecule to uh, you know uh, like coming back to ranibizumab yeah so thank you ashish i uh, think we are so running much. out of time
So if we are looking at a different molecule, uh, aflibercept still is better than zib aflibercept because the dosage is almost half of what ILEA you would normally give. So, but it does work in many cases, but I wouldn't call it as the exact replacement for ILEA. Thank you so much. So I now uh, invite uh, Dr. Manvi. Uh, she will be talking on what should I choose, DME, AMD, and Venus. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, VRSI, for having me here. And I think after all these amazing talks, a lot of my job is actually understand. I'm supposed to be guiding us in the choice of an antivirus agent or an injection, actually, and a drug. But in, let me give some case examples. And in DME, I think on the gold standard is now drug injection. And when you have a case with uh, quite some, uh, simple OCT biomarkers, you can expect good uh, resolution of injection with just a loading growth and then. Uh, maintain the patient with observation afterwards, but when you have a uh, patient with a lot of signs of chronicity, a lot of SRF, maybe a higher than the macular thickness, HRF has been mentioned by some of our speakers here, you need repeated and sustained treatment, and, and these cases may require a switch over to steroid for an optimal response. The uh, afibercept, we all started off this conversation with Dr. Shobhan Prasad talking on afibercept. So, this is a patient who was treated treatment nine with afibercept for DME. And uh, there was an excellent response with uh, two inje three injections in the right side. The left side required one more injection. And uh, not only the reduction in the DME, there's also a very good improvement in vision. The left eye went from 660 to 612. There's also a lot of restoration of the various layers of the retina seen with the equivalent sets in this case. And as already mentioned, uh, we have the trial data also showing similar outcomes. And patients who have had multiple antivirus injections and continue to have a poor response on multiple recurrences, a switch to steroids or orthodex can be a good option. And this patient with, who had received multiple adaptions actually initially with the switch to orthodex and pre orthodex injection showed a good drying effect and which was maintained for a long time after the injection with the Most people recommend the use of steroids in cases where there is a large amount of subfoliate heart injury. So, some points to ponder is the use of antibiotics in patients with a recent history of a cardiovascular event is where. Most people recommend a six month delay in the, the use of an antivirus, and that's when you would probably use steroids in the first case. A switch of a drug is recommended if you have a less than 10% response with sustained treatment, which could be three, a minimum of a three injection to up to six injections. And in chronic edema, a percept or ozodex work better. In AMD, when you have a type 2 membrane or a classic membrane, the danilizumab works very well with good resolution of membrane, and this usually requires lesser number of injections. Also, in type 1 membrane, the response can be very variable, like this case, which I like to call my textbook case, when you give up three injections and you have a good drying effect and you can then move on to treat an extent. Or another case here, which was primarily treated with aflibercept, and you have a good resolution of the membrane. But other cases don't respond really so much, like this uh, gentleman who initially had this PED in the uh, superior temporal aspect. And was treated uh, PRN with bevacizumab because we could not identify any polyps in our initial imaging. And with the appearance of fluid, he received treatment. And later on, he showed a regression of that initial PED and an appearance of another PED below. And this was when uh, imaging finally showed us polyps. And then he was switched over to eight level set with good resolution of the PED as well as the fluid uh, with uh, sustained treatment. Also, we have seen donosumab where we have used that it's not only dramatic reduction in fluid, but also a re reduction in lesion size is often noted in these cases. Switching can help us, like this first gentleman who had a poor response to danilizumab uh, for the both PD as well as fluid had a good response to a switch over to donosumab. In cases where there is fluid which is persistent, sustaining treatment and being persistent with treatment can also help maintain the visual acuity of the patient even in cases where drying cannot be achieved. So in AMD, a type 2 membrane may respond well to randomizumab. Type 1 membranes usually require more injections. 
in case of polyps, the clibercept or rolosumab would be the drug of choice. And with the concern that has been expressed since morning about the IOI and rolosumab, would we really want to load it uh, four weekly or would we like to load it at a longer duration of interval? I think in India, almost everybody is using it PR and from the get go. In RBO, the response is again very variable. Like we have spontaneous resolution, this patient who did not come for the advice injection, like this is what BDOS showed us many years ago. Or you can have good response, a patient showing complete resolution which was sustained for a long time with a few injections of antibiotics. Or a patient who keeps having this waxing and waning course of the edema goes away with the injection, then comes back, then goes away, then comes back, resulting in a chronic edema and now has been advised in alternate injection. The main reason behind this in RBOs, especially in the underlying amount of ischemia that is present, and those with ischemia are likely to require a more number of treatment, have poorer visual outcomes to achieve a good outcome. So to conclude, if I had DNA, if there was no sign of chronicity, ranibizumab or rabacizumab worked well. With chronicity or poor baseline visualizability, one would consider a percent In patients with extensive heart activities or cardiovascular event, we would think of serums. In EMD, type 2 membranes do well with ranibizumab. Type 1 membranes consider a switch when there is a poor response or a switch back, as we have seen right now. And in polyps, a percent or rabacizumab with PDT when and where available. In RBO, the management depends upon the underlying amount of ischemia and with multiple differences, one may consider opioids. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Manu. Very nice, uh, you know, concluding points and summarizing how to choose which one. Yeah. There is a question from the audience. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Shoba can take this. This is from Nirod Sahu. Uh, decade ago, there was a lot of talk regarding worsening of macular ischemia with anti -VHF. People used to talk a lot about it. Uh, is there any worsening of macular ischemia? Probably the straightforward answer you know, we have been giving for so many years. We haven't found. Dr. Soba, uh, you have any analysis of long term follow up of patients with OCPA or Actually, when you see worsening, you should suspect that the disease is worsening, not due to anti but natural history is promoting it. Thank you so much. So, in the interest of time, we will move on to the next talk by Dr. Ale Banker. He will be talking on visual fields in severe ROPIs receiving laser versus anti What do you want? Thank you, Dr. Raja and VRSI for giving me this opportunity to present my work on visual fields in eyes with severe ROP who have been treated with uh, either anti vegf or laser as primary monotherapy. Uh, so the main purpose of our study was to examine the binocular visual fields in these children and eyes treated with severe ROP, uh, now it's known as AROP, uh, which were treated either with bevacizumab or laser as primary therapy were included and the standard 30-2 and 60-4 fields were done by a mask glaucoma specialist who reported the visual field analysis in all these patients. So this is a small pilot study that we have initiated in patients who are now more than 10 years of follow-up. And this included six eyes in three patients in the laser and 31 eyes of 17 in the anti vegf groups. Uh, and uh, the mean age of treatment you can see was about nine weeks in the laser and about eight weeks. Uh, our small pilot study showed that children who had anti vegf uh, treatment had significantly preserved uh, central as well as peripheral visual fields than those who were treated with lasers. Uh, children with high myopia, ROP sequelae, uh, particularly having unilateral myopias, also had my uh, peripheral loss. Just to show you a few examples, this was one of the case, uh, initially we used to call it as an APROP and this was a twin case, uh, the other child died and this was treated with laser and this is, you can see how the laser marks have enlarged over 10 years of follow up and you can see the structural changes also on the OCT and when we do the perimetry, the 30-2 shows a loss of field not only in the central but this is very striking when you do the 60-4. It's almost like the fields of retinitis pigmentosa with only a central tubular vision left in these patients. Uh, another case, again, treated with laser, and you can see the central field showing very early changes, 
But when you do the 60-4, again, you have the kind of ring scotoma uh, because of the severe destruction of the peripheral retina from laser. As opposed to this, this is a case uh, of APROP, which was treated only with anti-VEGF initially, and you can see the good anatomic response with the anti-VEGF. And you can see the white field fundus photos and the angiogram showing a little bit of avascularity in the temporal periphery uh, with no structural changes on the OCT. Uh, this girl actually had a unilateral high myopia and that eye showed visual changes, but the other eye uh, showed absolutely normal central changes as well as very minimal changes in the peripheral 60-4. This is another case, you can see the 30-2 looking completely normal, like a normal eye, and the 60-4 also showing just a few peripheral architects, but no loss of visual fields. Uh, this is again another case, the 30-2 completely normal, and the peripheral fields showing a little bit of the architects uh, in the inferior fields. Uh, this is an interesting case. Uh, this is twin one, again, treated with primary anti vegf and you can see the white field photos and the red free photographs uh, showing almost fully vascularized retina with just one disc area, avascular retina in the temporal periphery. This is the 30-2. You can see minimal or absolutely no changes. 60-4 also showing very good preservation of the peripheral fields as well. This is the second child of the same uh, group, again showing very good vascularity, reaching almost up to the aura uh, with only anti vegf no lasers. And these are the fields again, the 30-2 and the 60-4. Uh, just to conclude, this is a very small pilot study that we have undertaken. There are almost no field analysis in the literature uh, in ROP treated eyes. So we thought that we should start learning about what is happening. Uh, the anti vegfs we all know, uh, preserves the visual fields and allows the vascularity to reach the periphery and hence allows us to destroy less of the retina in the periphery. Now this is extremely important because uh, in a child, the 75% of what children learn during the early years of life is processed through their vision, which empowers them to see a whole new world and not only reach important milestones, but also socially grow. So this requires not only the central, but also good peripheral vision loss. And I think with the use of anti vegfs particularly in severe cases of ROP, we'll be able to preserve their peripheral fields in a much better way than with lasers and allow their general development of this children in the future. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation, Dr. Ali. Uh, congratulations on this. Uh, what is the, uh, do you have serial visual fields like longitude in terms of longest follow-up? Yes, so we started doing these fields first time uh, when the children were nine, eight years of age actually, and we did not get very good fields. So then we started doing them every six months. And now what we found that at 10 years, uh, we get very good results. I mean, most children are very comfortable. They give good response. And we are continuing doing these fields every year. So now the longest follow-up is 14 years. So what percentage of our ROPs are you now treating with anti vegf and what percentage? My severe ROP, my primary treatment is always an anti vegf I allow the vascularity to grow almost up to zone two anterior or even up to zone three and only then I laser. But I tend to follow up these babies uh, as long as I can. And only if I feel that there is a large avascular area, only then I laser. Otherwise, I try to prolong them as far as possible. Great. Dr. Dogra, any comments? I think uh, most uh, at this time would first treat with anti vegf if it is zone one ROP or what is for now AROP what uh, he mentioned, the new classification, and then let the vascularization grow. Then either it starts recurring back or it is not growing further, then most people are still adding laser. So that is what the current uh, scenario we look at. Since there is approval for uh, Rani Bizu map uh, in many countries now, so that is after the rainbow trial. So it has become much easier uh, for people to use this and have better results. And what 
Ale has mentioned, I must say, I think visual field preservation is very important. I've been from an era where we have killed retina right up to near the macula. And because we wanted child somehow to have vision, and uh, those uh, children, they do have a lot of issues as far as field is concerned. And so uh, what he presented, and of course, the refractive error most of the time is related more to the severity of the disease. This we are also seeing. It may not be directly related to laser versus I, I agree with Dr. Dobra because even in cases what our long-term study has now shown that even in cases who have received just anti vegf without laser also tend to have high myopia. So I think it's not just the laser that is causing the high myopia but the severity of the disease at the onset itself. Dr. Lindo. I have a question for you in the sense that it's working. Um, I understand that when it is zone one or extreme post zone two, yes. all of us agree to give anti vision first and let the vascularization come forwards. But what if somebody comes with a mid zone two or a mid relatively anti zone two? Would you still try anti vision first you to bring it even further forward? Yes, sir. Or what would be the consensus of opinion to use laser first? Uh, personally, I still use anti vegf first. That's one. Second point is the, the patients who have had anti vegf only a small percentage of them would have also had laser, right? Yes. Most of them would not have had. Yes. So what is the explanation for the peripheral field effect in those eyes where you did not do laser? Is there any neurological reason why they should have a peripheral uh, effect? So there were only the two eyes uh, of those cases who had a very minimal peripheral field effects. Uh, maybe it is related so to some the... of them I have seen in So that's the ar artifact. That's the artifact. Okay. Yeah, that's the artifact. Yeah. So it's Thank nicely you, related to the avascular peripheral retina. Thank you. So I think we are, we are running out of time. Uh, we move on to the last talk by Dr. Ajay Aroda. Um, he will be talking on to evaluate the efficacy of centrifuge ramps known in supracoronal space. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thanks, uh, VLSF, for the opportunity. So I will be discussing the, to evaluate and efficacy of centrifuge stamps known in the uh, of space. We know from various studies that uh, trans when injected in the superfluid space, okay? and it's been shown time and again that uh, it's also safe. The problem is how do we get into the superfluid space? So we have the microneedle available from the side. We have microcatheterization, and then we have the regard which many people use. So what we did was we made a device which can use the uh, normal 30 H needle to inject in the superfluid space. We did, a, we did some animal studies where we injected uh, uh, amsonon, beta cellulose, and hedon, as you can see in the UBM, which we were able to get into the superfluid space very effectively, and we dissected out the uh, superfluid space in the animal eyes, and we could demonstrate the presence of uh, the, the transfer into the superfluid space. Then we did a pilot study when Ozodex was not available. As you can see in this patient, with persistent diabetic macroderema in both eyes, we received Ozodex as well as anti -vegip. And this patient was treated, you can see, over a period of 78 days where the patient did well. This is uh, baseline, and this is what happened on the 14th day, and the patient did well. Our next step was to see if we can extend the duration of action. So we went ahead and centrifuged the transmilon. Basically, the 1 ml autocot was centrifuged, 0.8 ml of the supernatant was removed, and 0.2 ml of centrifuged transmilon was injected, which varies between 16 to 20 milligrams, which is eventually injected into the superfluid space. So this is a small study where there's a follow-up of two years on these patients, nine superfluid injections in uh, uh, four patients, where we had done. So this is uh, uh, the way the injections are given into the infotemporal or infonasal quadrant. It, once you've uh, got a hang of it, it works really well. We're trying to make it as safe as possible by modifying this device to an extent where everybody can use it. It does need some learning time. So this is the patient who received the normal uh, uh, transform in terms of the stage, which lasted for about four months. It's the patient of non-infectious diabetes, the macular edema resolved and remained resolved for about four months. This patient came back and we injected centrifuge transplant and you can see here 
that the second injection of centrifuge transplant lasted almost eight months. This patient was then re-injected and the second injection lasted for almost about seven months. So the effect, there's no drug at the point available of steroids where the effectivity is more than more than three months. Here the effect we are getting from a superfluid space injection of a centrifuge transplant without any side effects. All these patients were put on dolzolamide or, or uh, brimalol. And this is another patient of uveitis who had treated in 2014, received superfluid injection of transplant, and the patient did well. The effect lasts for almost six and a half months. This is the baseline data uh, of uh, the re reduction and improvement, uh, reduction of macular thickness and improvement of visual acuity. So the take home is that a centrifuge transplant is uh, can be safely and consistently given with a 30 gauge needle into the superfluid space. It is very cheap. The needle costs only two rupees. The centrifugation has allowed us to extend the duration of action to about seven to eight months. The extended to the duration of action makes it a promising treatment, especially in the Indian scenario, where cost is a factor. The limitation at the moment is the small sample size. I have over 98 eyes. We have an injected transplant normally, but a centrifuge transplant, we now have about 18 eyes, but a follow-up is variable. So I presented only those eyes where I have a two-year follow-up. A long-term and a larger study by multiple users is required. The risk of infection should always be kept in mind mind and all aseptic precautions taken. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ajay. Um, I have a question. Whether you have done any pharmacokinetic analysis, I mean, it's difficult, but let's say even from an AC tap, you've done, you said seven to eight months, that's the clinical action that you're seeing. Have you ever looked at the drug concentration in the eye over a period of time? So I have personally not looked at it, but there are studies available in literature where they've injected uh, tribes known in the superfarmer space and they found that uh, the amount of drug which is present in the AC is, is, is hardly. We have uh, the indirect evidences that uh, despite injecting in so many cases, we have not had a patient. There's one patient who went in for filtering surgery, and that patient had an interval vitreal injections and it, it did not go into the superfluid space but otherwise uh, we have not had yeah and very clever congratulations that's a really interesting device that you did i have a couple of questions the first one is so i noticed that so did you create some kind of a measurement to know if you're not going too further away or do you have like a mark in the device that you're not you're you having the the, the needle uh not going further away and not avoiding in, into a different space the second question is have you ever uh tried to uh have you ever uh, tried to do an oct in this area so and, and the third question is have you seen any scleral melt or something similar inflammation scleritis so the second question first that we before we decided to inject we did an anti-signal oct in uh, normal Indian patients to see what is the level thickness in various parts. We measured in supratemporal, supranasal, infratemporal, infranasal, and uh, the Hulzerty quadrants. And we found that in Indian eyes, the maximum thickness was in the infranasal and infratemporal quadrant. Second, if we gave an injection in the Hulzerty quadrant, patient had pain because the long posterior nerves are located in, never give an injection in the Hulzerty quadrant. Third, Based upon the, so initially I was doing this uh, thickness measurements in each patient. So we made a nomogram depending upon the angulation of at different distance. So we, I know, so I inject completely and I know that if uh, a sphere of thickness is so much, I have different devices available of different angulation. So on that angulation, I can know because if you go vertically, the distance traveled is less. If you travel obliquely, the distance travel is more as this angulation comes down. So as the angulation comes down, the length of travel changes. So if a sclera is thinner or the sclera is thicker, the angulation can change. I can yet get into the superfluid space. So once we know that, it's very easy to help. Second thing is when you enter, what I found is that you should, I, I twirl a little bit. I do a little rotation, the entry becomes very small. The, the, the injection should be done at a time when you find a free flow of the drug. 
If there is free flow, you are either in the intravitreal space or in the supracanonic space. Most often, uh, we, we have had very few intravitreal injections here in the supracanonic space. If you are not in the supracanonic space and in the sclera, you will find a business. Last, it should be bevel down. Very nice. Yeah. It's a very interesting device. One last question from the audience actually to Dr. Manvi Sindal. Uh, Dr. Manvi, if you can take this question. The question is, do you routinely treat eyes with just PED without intraretinal or subretinal fluid? Uh, no, we don't routinely treat eyes with just PED without fluid. We do look for fluid and only then treat, which is what I showed in that first patient of mine of polyps that he was received treatment whenever he had the presence of fluid, but not when he only had a PED scene. But we do know that these PEDs ha ha harbor membranes and polyps under them. So classic treatment guidelines have been targeted towards fluid and uh, that's when we call them exudative membranes and that's when we treat them. So if it's a naive patient without fluid, we would probably observe. But now newer drugs are showing a regression of the lesions also. So I think our paradigms are going to change very soon. Great, wonderful answer. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers, the panelists, and the audience also for the wonderful questions. Thank you all so much.